Good afternoon and welcome to the Yorkshire Museum. My name is Lucy and I'm a curator here um, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of a series of short curator talks where we will be exploring some objects up close and in detail that are on display here as part of our new exhibition, Richard III Coming Home, which you can visit here at the Yorkshire Museum until the 31st of October. Um, Welcome to viewers from both Facebook and YouTube. We're streaming live to you both today. Uh, we'd encourage this to be as interactive as you like, so please ask your questions and put your comments in the comments section on Facebook and YouTube. Then after I've talked a little bit about these objects, we'll open the floor to questions and have a brief discussion. Don't worry if you lose connection issues, if you've got slightly dodgy Wi-Fi. This is being recorded and it'll be available to watch on YouTube and Facebook after the fact. So today we're going to look at 15th century York, the York that Richard III would have known. Now Richard was a uniquely Norman king and he spent much of his life here in the north of England and especially in Yorkshire. He spent his child um, at, near Little Castle and then he later, in 1471, inherited the estates of the Neville family, so vast swathes of land across not just Yorkshire but the north of England, including Middle Castle, which he went on to make his family home with his wife Anne. And he would have been a familiar figure in the city of York. His face would have been known on the streets of the medieval city. And we actually know from the well-preserved and extensive city records that survive from Richard's reign that he had a very close relationship with the city. They relied on him for, um, for a number of reasons and in turn the city supported him when they needed it, when he needed it, sorry. So 15th century York was a century of contrasts and it was a time of change for the city. It started in the, around the year 1400 when York was at its peak in terms of prosperity, wealth and population and prestige in fact. It was second only to London in England, very much the capital of the north. However, in the second half of the 15th century, we see a change, we see a decline in terms of prosperity, wealth, and population. Over the course of this century, population in the city halves from around 14,000 to 7,000. There's a number of reasons for this, we can explore those a little bit later, um, but I'm going to show you several objects today that show um, the positive side of the 15th century, show York at its absolute peak. So, the first of these objects is this tiny object on my tray here. It's a beautiful gold ring. Now, York being a centre for manufacturing and commerce was a draw for overseas immigrants who had skills in those areas. We actually know that from 1400, the majority of immigrants to York were metal workers. And in fact, there were lots of goldsmiths traveling to the city from the Low Countries and the Rhineland. York would have been second only to London as a city that specialized in goldsmithing. And this little ring that we call the Fulford Ring um, was it well, is the finest example of medieval goldworking that's been found in the city of York. We're very lucky to have it in our collection. It was found by a metal detectorist in the year 2016, and the Yorkshire Museum was able to acquire it thanks to generous grants from the Headley Trust, Arts Council England, and the Victoria and Albert Museum Purchase Grant Fund. Um, as its name may suggest, it was found near Fulford. Now, Fulford is a suburb of, of modern York. Um, but in the 15th century, in the rest of the medieval period, it was a small village about a mile outside of the city defences on the road south to Selby. And what this little ring shows, along with other examples of opulent and elite jewellery, is the wealth that the citizens and the people of York held. And they were able to spend it on such beautiful items of jewellery um, and also many other things that we will explore later. But let's return to this tiny ring. 
and hopefully um, our camera and your um, computer screens can show off just how fantastic and detailed this is. As you can see, the gold band here is decorated with a very small and intricate floral motif. It's very delicate now, but originally it would have been um, even more striking and the slight recesses here would have been filled with a dark enamel, so it would have looked really quite beautiful. But the star of the show is the bezel, so the top of the ring, the bit that would have been on prime display. As you can see, it's set with two different precious gemstones, one red and one green. We've, um, well, the British Museum, in fact, um, did some science on this ring, and these stones have been tested using a scientific technique called Raman spectroscopy. And that was able to determine that these are real rubies and emeralds, not just colored glass that was quite common in less fancy items of jewelry. Um, and of course, these opulent materials speak to the exotic trade networks which York was part of in the medieval period. We often think of the medieval period and as medieval cities as being quite insular and inward looking, but York was very much through its riverine trade network that stretched down the ooze to Hull and then out to the North Sea and beyond, very much connected to the wider world and materials and goods from all over the world would be traded in York's markets. And as well as these beautiful colours making for a striking piece of jewellery, um, we know from medieval texts that coloured stones actually held magical, spiritual and medicinal properties for the wearers and the viewers in medieval times. So the green of the emerald, as well as supposedly protecting the wearer from poisoning, um, was meant to protect their chastity also. When we um, contrast or compare that to the ruby, which was a symbol of love, what we seem to have here in the bringing together of these two properties is a love token that may have been gifted from one lover to another. Of course, we'll never know exactly who wore and unfortunately lost this ring in Fulford in the 15th century, but what we can very much assume that it is that it was one of the wealthy, one of the many wealthy occupants of York, perhaps a merchant or a craftsperson themselves. So the wealthy citizens of York didn't just spend money on beautiful jewellery for themselves. The wealth that was prevalent in the city can be seen in the number of building projects that were carried out and completed in the 15th century where wealthy members of the city's elite would give gifts to, in this case, parish churches so that they could be done up. Um, and parish churches where the majority of the, um, the population of York would have worshipped seemed to be a real focus of this, um, this kind of patronage and this activity. With 35, at least 35 of the 40 parish churches in York getting a bit of a renovation between 1350 and 1450. And this fantastic object here um, is some surviving evidence of one of those renovations that took place. Um, this fantastic figure is from um, the church of St. Martin le Grand on Coney Street, right in the center of York. It's an oak corbel which essentially would have decorated um, a wooden roof. And it also provides um, some kind of, well, I'll show you how it works when you look at the back of it. And um, what's so spectacular about this object is that the colour, the paint survives in such vibrancy. So you can see that we can see the angel um, with flowing hair is wearing white robes. They've got a very healthy complexion and red lips and then this um, fiery flowing hair. Uh, if we look on the back of this object, so I'm going to just spin, spin ourselves around a little bit. You can see it's not quite as beautiful, but it's just as interesting. Um, we have what's, what's called a tenon here at the back, and this is what would have attached the, um, the corbel to, um, to the roof itself, and it would have been secured here by a peg. And if you look very closely, you might just be able to see some scratched lines in the surface of the object here, the Roman numeral VII. 
this was written and um, scratched into the, the wood by the medieval carpenter. And it was probably a, a, an, an aid memoir to remind them where on earth to um, affix this beautiful corbel to the roof. So St. Martin the Grand was one of the many churches in York that underwent a renovation in this period. We know that the, this particular renovation was undertaken in the 1440s where the aisle and the nave of the church was completely, um, completely renovated and given a new roof. Um, a few hundred years later, the Victorians came along and decided to remodel um, and the medieval roof was lost. And luckily, five of these wonderful painted pieces were acquired by the Yorkshire Museum and you can see two of them, in fact, in our Richard III Coming Home exhibition. So I think these two objects speak really nicely to the opulent, colourful and prosperous York that, that its residents would have known at the beginning of the 15th century. And as I said, things did change throughout that century and the city did see a certain level of decline. And actually, the York of the later 15th century, the York that Richard III would have known, would have been in strong need of an important friend such as Richard who could get things done and had access to the crown. The change in the fortunes of York was due to many reasons but one of the major reasons was a decline in the market for cloth overseas and this had a huge impact on York's, medieval York's, two main industries, cloth making and commerce. This, along with a move of such industries away from cities to more regionally based activity and the growing um, prosperity of London, London started to monopolise both the manufacturing and commerce market at this time, saw so declining wealth for York and also a declining population. People move where the jobs and the opportunities are. So even though the picture for York looked a little bit sadder in the second half of the 15th century, it was still the major city in the north of England and a thriving centre for craft, commerce and many, many wonderful objects were created during this time. One of them is right behind me, you've been staring at it the whole time. Um, so even though I've painted this rather doom and gloom picture of the second half of the 15th century, um, for medieval York. It's actually during this period that the York's most iconic building was actually finished, York Minster. The Minster, after um, being enlarged and renovated for hundreds of years, was finally completed and reconsecrated in the year 1472. And this object, I was going to call it a fragment, but to call something so large a fragment seems a little bit strange. And this object behind me, would have been the centrepiece of that uh, renovated York Minster. This is a base fragment from the shrine of Saint William, York's saint. William Fitzherbert was twice um, Archbishop of York in the 12th century, and he was said to have died after being poisoned at mass. Shortly after his death, miracles were said to have been carried out by his tomb and he was canonised a century later. This is actually the second shrine of St. William that would have stood at York Minster, um, the first being built in the, in the 14th century, and this a larger, grander example, um, fit for the many pilgrims who would visit York, was finished in the 15th. What we're looking at here are um, two little alcoves that visitors to the Minster would have kneeled and prayed in front of. And why this object is so key to the story of Richard III is that well, it was completed during the period when he would have been most regular, regularly visiting York. It's incredibly likely that he himself sat and kneeled in front of these niches um, and paid homage to the city saint William. It may also be the case that the grandeur of the new minster and the new shrine of St. William actually um, encouraged him to think about a new um, building project of his own. Um, in 1484, 
Richard made a great endowment to York Minster to develop a major college there that would have had a hundred priests that would have prayed and worshipped in the king and the royal family's name. The very scale of this, this plan, this plan that never actually came to fruition um, because Richard died just one year later, suggests quite strongly that Richard was planning to be buried here at York Minster. This wouldn't be so surprising. Um, his brother, Edward IV, had booked the trend of being buried at Westminster Abbey and was buried um, at the chapel at Windsor. So it seems quite likely that Richard would want to be buried, remembered and revered in the city that he saw as home. Um, so those are just three objects, two little, one not so little, from 15th century York that I think speak to the opulence of um, the opulence and colourful nature of the medieval city. Yes, you really can't appreciate this object, the shrine, unless you get up incredibly close. It's very well preserved. So it's made from a material that's known as Eggleston marble. Eggleston being um, the place in, in County Durham where this material um, you get outcrops of this material. It's very, very hard. It's a very hard form of limestone. And what that means is that the cuts are incredibly sharp. Um, on softer forms of limestone, often the detail of this, um, of this type of carving is lost. There's also another very important reason that this has survived in the condition that it has. And we're very lucky that there is part of this shrine here surviving today. In King Henry VIII's reformation of the church, it was an order that all saintly shrines be destroyed. And the havoc and the wreckage to many churches that we can still see today shows that that was, that was carried out on a large scale. However, the shrine of St. William was carefully dismantled and buried in the grounds of York Minster. Presumably, it was an object that was seen as simply too holy and precious to fall to that fate. A few hundred years later, um, it was rediscovered and excavated, and the objects, well, the fragments from it sit here in the Yorkshire Museum, where you can visit them today. So all of these objects that we talked about today are on display as part of our brand new exhibition at the Yorkshire Museum, Richard III Coming Home. The most spectacular object of all in the exhibition is one that I haven't shown you today. You'll have to come and see that yourself. The wonderful portrait of Richard III, which is on loan to us from the National Portrait Gallery. So now, we're coming to the end of my talk, so I'm going to invite you to ask your questions in the comments on both Facebook and YouTube. Um, and yes, I would welcome any questions that you have about Richard or 15th century York. And perhaps whilst we are looking, we can have a little look at some of the decoration on the shrine. So hopefully, again, our camera will be able to pick out the wonderful um, monks' heads. We have got leaves and possibly a jester-type figure here. Um, of course, there's all of this wonderful tracery that mimics the larger niches and architecture that would be displayed in the wider shrine. I don't think we've got any questions coming through, so Sorry, someone, I'll give you a few more minutes. Someone has asked from YouTube, much of the stonework was painted in vibrant colours. Would this be true with the fragments you are showing here? That's a very interesting question. And you're right that medieval York and medieval England would have been an absolute kind of parade of colour. We think of the medieval period as very plain in terms of the remains that survive because we see the, the weathered versions of them, bare stone. However, I think this example here um, would have been, is a very nice reminder of the vibrancy of especially religious buildings. Um, the, this corbel would have been one of many colourful decorated corbels of different designs that would have 
stood proud on a painted wooden roof. So you're absolutely right that the, um, the, the minister and parish churches and churches of various scale throughout the city would have been a variety of colour. The Shrine of St. William itself, there's no traces of paint surviving on it. And actually the style of this, um, of this second shrine, the 15th century shrine, is a little bit more plain and austere. Um, although there's all of this tracery and wonderful detail, actually if you take a step back, it's almost slightly minimalist in its design. Um, so no, I don't believe that the Shrine of St. William would have been painted in the wonderful array of colours like we, like we have here, but there are many examples of stonework and even fragments of plaster that give us real hints as to the wonderful variety of colour that a resident of medieval York would have enjoyed on a daily basis. Someone has asked, when was the shrine rediscovered and was it by chance or was it planned? That's a really good question. Um, the shrine, I can't remember the exact date. The shrine was re rediscovered in the 19th century. Um, and again, I'm not sure whether it was by chance or, um, or happy accident. Um, and who knows if there were further fragments of shrine in the, in the Minster Yard today. You raise a really good um, point about how material has kind of come into the collections of the Yorkshire Museum and there are varied stories from across the medieval and wider collection. The Yorkshire Museum here opened in 1830, but our collections stretch back even beyond that and we've acquired objects in a variety of ways from both the city of York and the wider county. Today we often acquire objects like the Fulford Ring through metal detectorists, from people who were out there looking for them, or equally through excavations where archaeologists have gone um, have gone and excavated a site with the plan to find specific remains. However, archaeology as a discipline um, is fairly new. And in the 19th century, there weren't um, archaeologists as such. We have antiquarians whose techniques are not quite as scientific or methodical, but they equally, they had an equally um, strong interest in bettering our understanding of the past. So lots of the Yorkshire Museum's historic collections don't have the precise kind of contextual data that modern excavated material does. Someone has asked, is there a model or artist's impression of how York would look in the 15th century? There is, and it's a fantastic question because there's one on our wall right over here. Um, this is a fantastic drawing by an artist called Edwin Visdale Tate, and it shows York at the end of the 15th century. Um, you can see some of the major landmarks here. We have Clifford's Tower, um, the keep of the medieval castle on its, on, its, um, on its mound here, and of course York Minster dominating the skyline. What you can really tell from, um, from images like this, which is, of course is not a contemporary image, um, but it's based on good knowledge and sound evidence of the medieval city. You can see just how religious institutions such as um, parish churches, um, friaries and abbeys absolutely dominated the skyline. Um, you can also see how the city was really crowded around the River Ouse. The River Ouse was the absolute lifeblood of the city. Um, much more central, I think, to the city than it is now. You can see here is um, the medieval Ouse Bridge, and that's actually where some of the city's most important buildings were, including um, a chapel to St. William um, and other important courts, prisons and meeting houses. Um, so in some ways, the 15th century York looks much like it does today, if you can fill in these blank fields with um, with houses and other buildings but you can see how um, how there has been a lot of change of course we are at the yorkshire museum 
just about over here this is the church of saint mary's abbey um, and the yorkshire museum sits on top of um, the saint mary's abbey pre precinct and if you visit us you can see both the remains of the spectacular abbey church in the museum gardens and remains of the chapter house and vestibule here in our medieval gallery so that was a very convenient question and i'm glad we stood here for the talk Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed having a look up close at some of these objects and learning a little bit more about 15th century York. These objects are all on display at the Yorkshire Museum until the 31st of October as part of our Richard III Coming Home exhibition. Tickets are available to book online on our website and I do hope you'll come and see the portrait of Richard and of course all of these objects as well. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. As I said, this is the second of a series of talks. We, are, we have two types of online talks available for this exhibition, actually. In, we have these kind of short collection snapshots where we'll be looking at a particular object in the collection, and then some slightly longer, more in-depth expert lectures. So if you've enjoyed this, you might enjoy checking those out as well. And finally, if you have enjoyed today or any more of our online programming, um, please do consider making a donation to the Art Museums Trust. Again, you can do that on our website. Thank you very much.